To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away by and by I'll fly away Be seated please Good morning Great to see you here this morning and if you're visiting with us you're an honored guest and we really appreciate you coming and worshiping God here at North Highlands with us um, if you'd like to follow along with the lesson on your uh, smartphone or other device, uh, you might have to go through the link in Facebook. I hate to send you to Facebook right at the beginning of the sermon, but anyway, if uh, the, the, the link th from the Uversion app doesn't seem to be working on some phones here recently, and so uh, if you go to Facebook, there's links there on my page and on the, the church page that you'll be able to get to those uh, uh, notes, and I encourage you to do that, and then again to use that later in the week. Uh, in a family Bible study to look at some of the things that we've studied here and, and uh, consider them again and look at uh, this week some of the promises of God. That's what I'd like to talk about uh, this morning just for a little while. The, uh, the promises that God has made to us, the certain promises that he has uh, helped to establish our faith on uh, based on his holy and, and certain word. He has given us promises. He has fulfilled so many promises in the past. And we're going to look at one example of that uh, when we consider the children of Israel, how that he saved them from slavery in Egypt and delivered them into freedom and then tried to give them a land of rest, tried to give them the promised land. And yet that first generation out of Egypt was faithless. They didn't take that land and, and a whole generation of God's people were lost. A whole generation died in the wilderness because they didn't have faith. Because of unbelief, they were not able to enter in to the promised land. You know, there's many instances of faithlessness from this generation. But I, I think this refusal to accept the promise here at the end, uh, to take God at his word, uh, this refusal to walk into the promised land was an amazing show of a lack of faith. And this lost generation, because of that lack of faith, um, they were lost. And they stayed in that desert for the rest of their lives. It was their children and their children's children who were able to take the promised land and be a part. And you know, it all came, apart, came about because they listened to a majority report rather than the minority report. Only two of the 12 spies came back and said, you know what, we can do this. God is with us and we can overcome whatever obstacle that's in our way. But 10 of those spies, they were faithless. And they came back and they said, there's giants in the land. There's walled cities. This place is fortified. There's no way we can do it. You see, they were looking at, at, at what was before them, but they were looking with no faith in their heart whatsoever. They didn't count on what God had already done for them. And when you think about who these people were, you got to remember what God had already done for them. The fact that deliverance was already proven to them. It was already proven. He had shown his ability to deliver on all of his promises. He had made a promise to Abraham to give them this land. He had made a promise that he would make a great nation out of them and then from that nation that the whole world would be blessed. And so these, these three promises uh, that everything rested on in the lives of this nation, this group of people, this family of Israel. You know, they were rescued from that slavery. Uh, God had brought them miraculously through the Red Sea. And these are the same people who saw that. These are the people who walked through on that dry ground. And, and he led them to Sinai. And there he gave them the law. He gave them the Ten Commandments. And they witnessed this. They, they had seen God's fulfillment of each and every promise. He fed them with manna from heaven. They received food without doing anything to prepare for the food. And, and it was just given to them. And so they had witnessed this and they had seen God meet their every need. And still, when it came time for them to step out by faith, they had none. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9, it, it says there, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. 
unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Now teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. They had been told, listen, don't forget. Don't forget all that God has done. And today, today we struggle with the same unbelief, don't we? We struggle with the same things that they did. Moses sent out those 12 spies to reassure the people of God's ability to deliver. That was the purpose. Uh, their, their command in sending them out was to go and, and bring back some fruit, bring them back and, and show the people all that God was giving to them. In Numbers chapter 13 and verse 17, it says, Moses sent them out to spy the land of Canaan. He said to the spies, go up this way into the south, go up through the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or their strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are forests there or not. And be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. And this was the time, this was the season for the first ripe grapes. And so here, here's the, the, the command. Go and, and bring back things to prove to the people what a wonderful land God is giving to us. Now come back and tell us the stories about the cities that are going to belong to us. Uh, the cities that we didn't build, uh, the, the fortifications that we didn't make and yet that are going to be given to us by God. Go and look at those beautiful uh, grapevines, all the fruit that this land has. Go and look at how good the land is, and come back and tell the people how beautiful and wonderful this land flowing with milk and honey truly is so that we can have confidence as we walk in and take what God has given to us. You see, these spies were given instructions about what to look for and how to go about their job the fact is, our deliverance has also been proven by a loving and powerful Father, a, a powerful Savior. You know, in Romans 15 and verse 4, he tells us that whatever things were written beforehand, like this story that we're reading about in Numbers 13, he, he says, whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. He says, you see how God fulfilled promises to these people? He's going to fulfill His promises to you too. You see how God dealt with His people in the Old Testament? This is how God deals with you. You see the love that God has for His people in the Old Law. He has that same passion, that same love for you. He says all these things are written so that you might have hope. You see, through the Old Testament, God is working this story. And it's the same example that these spies were supposed to go out and bring to us. The example of saying, look at how wonderful God is. Look at all that He's done for you and all He plans to do. And that's what the, the Scriptures do for us as we come through the Old Testament. And He delivers to us the New Testament in Jesus Christ. A, a promise built on the sacrifice of Himself. Uh, that He would give Himself that we could live for eternity with Him. There in Romans 15 and following in verse 5, it says, Now, the ba now may the God of patience... The God of comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the Father. You see, he says, I want you to learn from the times past so that you will understand who Jesus is. And the fact that Jesus is the culmination of all of those promises that have ever been made to bring about the salvation of mankind, to lift up mankind to the Creator, to the one who gave us life in the first place. So we should approach the throne of God. We should recognize all that He has done and walk confidently in this life through whatever obstacles we might face. Now, I don't know what obstacles are in your way right now. I don't know what kind of struggles you are facing right now, but I do know that everyone is either just coming through an obstacle, about to face an obstacle, or you're in an obstacle right now. You're in a struggle right now. Maybe a struggle even for your faith. And I would encourage you to remember that every struggle in this life, it calls out to the heart of God. Every one of us, every person on this planet, as they face struggles in life, as they go through these things, God is calling out to us through the struggle to remind us to 
base our faith on Jesus Christ, to keep our faith in Jesus Christ, and to walk confidently with faith through those struggles. In 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, it says this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son, Jesus. See, see, whoever has Jesus has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who do believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Jesus. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He says you should have confidence. That confidence should empower you for the struggle. That comfort, confidence should embolden you for the obstacle. That confidence should help you to endure through the obstacle, through the struggle that you face in this life. Every struggle that you face in this life. He tells us in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Oh, if those ten spies just would have had faith. If they just would have looked at the land and followed through with the commandment they had been given, with the orders that they had, instead of tripping over into God's area of deciding what's right and wrong. If they just would have stayed true to their assignment and done what they were told in obedient faith, they could have brought back a wonderful report like Joshua and Caleb did bring back, but they doubted. Deliverance was doubted. Notice the majority report as we read in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 27. It says, Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They bring back these grapes. They bring back uh, the fruit of the land. And nevertheless, they say, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, meaning giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and Amorites, they dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Here's their majority report. They're saying, it's, it's too much. Instead of seeing these cities as places where they now will occupy, places that will give them safety, they see them as places that they can't take. They see them as places uh, that stand against them. They see them as obstacles, as walls that will keep them from having the promise that God has made. Notice in verse 31, the men who had gone up with Caleb and Joshua, they said, we're not able to go up against these people. They're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You see, instead of faith, they feared. Even though God had promised them this land, uh, they should have seen those people. They should have seen those obstacles. They should have seen those walls as something God was delivering to them. But instead, they saw them as a problem. Instead of faith, they feared. And because of that fear, they went beyond the assigned responsibilities of their mission. They usurped the authority of God by inserting their own plans instead of faithfully following His plans. In Proverbs 3 and verse Five, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. And this is what they should have done. This is the lesson we learned from the past for our future, for our decisions, for the things that we face. To trust in the Lord and to put our confidence in what He says, the promises that He's given to us. In James chapter 1, the Holy Spirit speaking through James, the brother of Jesus, and, he, and he, he makes something perfectly clear. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. It will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded. He's unstable in all his ways. He says either you follow God's plan or you follow your own. Either you put your faith in Christ and you have confidence in Christ to see you through or you don't. Because when you doubt, when you refuse to follow by faith, then you're shrinking back from the promises of God. You're shrinking back from God Himself. The Holy Spirit gives us some insight in Romans chapter 11. I encourage you to turn over there. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Romans chapter 11. This can be... Uh, somewhat hard to understand but when you come at it and understand that he's speaking uh, about some of these very things that we're reading about I think it makes a lot more sense in Romans chapter 11 verse 1 Paul says I ask then has God rejected his people well by no means he says has God rejected Israel no he didn't reject them they rejected God but he never rejected them in this he says by no means for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? And remember in, in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 19, here's Elijah and he's, he's fearful for his life. He has destroyed the, the false prophets and now he's on a run for his life. And he reminds them about this. He, he says, what is it that, that God said to Elijah? Elijah said, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars. I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? God says, I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present, Paul says. He, he reminds us. He says, remember, there was always a remnant. He says, now you keep your faith. You keep your hope. He says, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. He says, God wants to extend His grace to the people of Israel also. He wants to extend His grace uh, to those who even don't believe. He wants to give it to them. Verse 11, it says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. <clears throat> Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them desire it more. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, which I would remind us in this room, we are. He says it means riches for you. How much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, and I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. He says, look, the, the point that God is bringing us to is a point at which uh, those who don't believe will believe. But they're not going to believe until they see your faith. Until they see you walking by faith. Until they understand that your deliverance is certain by the way that you live your life. He says it's so important that we who have been brought to Christ even though we have no uh, family heritage in the nation of Israel, in the Jewish nation, he says, but now you are an example for them that they might also come to faith. He says uh, in verse 18, don't be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. He's reminding us that it's Abraham. It's, it's those people of faith in the old law that we learn from who had faith in Christ, who, who had faith in God's promises to bring them to Christ. And they continued in their faith. And here we are standing on the foundation of their faith. What they taught us through their lives is what we grow in towards Christ. And he says, now you make sure you are growing in your faith that others might be able to follow you, that they might build also on your faith. He says in verse 21, For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. Note then the severity and the kindness of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness towards you, provided you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. 
And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they can be grafted back in for God has the power to graft them in again. Here's the point. He's saying, look, I know they failed, but they can stand again. They can rise up again. And the message to us this morning is God says, I know you've failed. I know that you've fallen. I know that you've made mistakes. I know that you have sinned. I know that you've turned your back on the promise. I I know that you've counted the the grace of God as as, as something uh, to be unworthy of your time. But God says, I can bring you back. He says, I can lift you up again. I can build you into something great again if you'll walk by faith. If you'll turn back Don't doubt God's promise to save you. He's able. Not only is he able to bring those who doubted back, he's able to bring you back. He's able to bring me back. He's able to deliver us into a great victory. In John 14, Jesus told us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas, he says, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, church, don't doubt your deliverance. Don't doubt God's promises to you. Don't ever turn your back on what God has done in the past for those who put their faith in Him and what He will do for you as you keep your faith in Him walking into an unknown future. Trusting Him with your daily needs. Trusting Him for your deliverance from whatever it is that troubles you. I want to encourage you. Don't be like those ten spies who were faithless. Instead... Let's listen to the minority report. The minority report because it helps us to understand that certain deliverance is coming. It's found there in Numbers 13 and verse 30. Notice verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up and at once take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. And what did he mean by that? He says, God is well able to overcome it. It's God. Instead of looking at how giant the people are, let's remember how giant our God is. Instead of looking at at how large the problem is, let's look at how great the solution is in our powerful and loving Father. Numbers 14 gives us a little bit more of the story in verse 6. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes. They were so upset that the people had no faith. They were so upset that the people were listening to the majority report instead of the minority report, listening to a faithless report instead of a faithful report. They tear their clothes. They spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and they said, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. But don't rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of this land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us, so don't fear. But all the congregation decided to stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before the children of Israel. And at that point, God says, none of you will enter in, except for Joshua and Caleb. None of you, you are lost. You're a lost generation because you didn't have faith in God. You see, it's impossible to please Him without faith. It's impossible to to, to somehow hope in an eternal home with Jesus without putting your faith in everyday actions in Jesus. And too often, we also let the majority reports determine our actions. We hear bad news all week. We watch television that defiles our conscience and dilutes our knowledge of the truth. We listen to music that glorifies sins and mocks righteousness. The majority of our time is spent consumed by the things and the ways of this world, while the minority of our time is given to God. It's offered to God on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or every now and then. That's why I encourage you, use these version notes on Tuesdays and Thursdays in a family devotional. 
study the Bible together at home. Give God more time. Make sure that the minority report that's going out to this world that Jesus saves is not a minority in your home, but that your home glorifies God by knowing His promises and having faith that He will fulfill them. Don't let your time slip away from you. Don't let the moments that you have to impact your family with faith get away from you because this is the time that you have. Caleb and Joshua had seen the same obstacles as those other ten spies. They walked by faith, not fear. They had confidence in God's ability, not their own ability, but God's ability to deliver them. And like Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit in Philippians 4.13, they said we can do all things. And we can do all things as we face adversity, as we face struggles, as we face obstacles. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Hebrews 13 and verse 6, it tells us we should boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What could man do to me? Your deliverance is also certain. But will you approach life as one who conquers or one who is conquered? Will you look at the things that happen in this life as as giants, as as huge walls and fortified cities that you can't overcome? Or will you look at them with eyes of faith and see how small they really are compared to your heavenly Father who has delivered you and continues to deliver you? Will you be saved or will you be lost? Notice with me in Hebrews 4 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest... Let us fear Him. Let us be faithful to Him. Rather than fearing the world, to fear God with respect and love. Let us fear Him, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, being, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. He says it's not enough to hear it's not enough to know all that God has done. It's not enough uh, to recognize the, the facts of history. It's not enough to, to understand uh, intellectually the things that have occurred in the past. It says it takes faith. And, and that when you hear those things of the past, for faith to be created into your heart and that you would live differently day to day than those who don't have faith. And by living that way, Jesus says, many will be brought to the kingdom because of your faith. So I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know what you're facing, but I know who you face it with. You face it with Jesus. He stands right beside you. He walks for you and he stands with you to overcome whatever obstacle there is before you. I encourage you, keep your faith in him and walk closely to him, bringing your family alongside of the Savior that they might have opportunity to grow in their faith and walk by faith in this fallen world. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we encourage you, stand with Jesus. Come to be a part of Him, having your sins washed away by His precious blood. And if you are a Christian but you've struggled, God says, I'll bring you back. I'll make you more than you ever were. I'll give you a hope. I'll bring you to a land of rest, a heavenly home great and wonderful eternal home in the presence of God your Father. Whatever your need is, won't you